Welcome, Benjamin. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you for having me. Happy Thank Friday. You. Oh, oh yes. am I allowed to say happy Friday? I, uh, okay, and I'll try to release this on a Friday. Okay. <laughs> Now I have a now I have a vision. I have to remember that. Um, well, thank you for adapting your magnum opus on grammar for younger readers. Because now I have two seventh graders, and I am going to park a copy in each of their rooms and hope that maybe they will stop only emailing with emojis and all sorts of other stuff, as you lamented in your book. <laughs> um, tell me about adapting your book for young readers, and what made you write all these books to begin with. Well, to start with the, the, the original version of the book, um, I had just got it into my head. There was one New Year's Eve. We were out in Los Angeles. We were having dinner and I made a New Year's resolution that I was going to start to write a little bit every day. And I hadn't written in, in a very long time. Um, I had been doing, of course, a lot of copy editing work for years. And, and, and I, I find copy editing hugely satisfying. I, I think that maybe some people have the idea that editors and copy editors are frustrated writers, but it's a different thing. You know, it's just it's a completely different thing. But I, I had I had loved doing it, but I had done writing many years before and just sort of stopped. And I made this New Year's resolution that I was I was going to start to write. So I was just writing a little bit every day, you know, whatever sort of came into my mind. But of course, as a person who's worked in publishing for years, the idea of writing into thin air seemed <laughs> sort of peculiar. It's like, so think of a project, to think of something you might actually like to do. And I thought I would like to write a book about copy editing. I would like to write a book about, about what I do. I, I am not always the champion of the write what you know idea, but it's not the worst idea on earth either. <laughs> so um, I think it depends on what you know. Ex exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I, I got it into my head that I, I wanted to write this book and um, in a not very long amount of time ended up uh, uh, under contract to my own publishing house, to Random House. Um, and, and a few years later, a lot longer than I thought it was going to take, a lot longer than everybody thought it was going to take, there was a book. And that book was published, actually it'll be two years ago at the end of this month. Wow, okay. Um, and, and- And it's so, in like, it's zillionth printing, basically. It, 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 it's either in its zillionth printing or it's 11th printing. Whatever, uh, same, same call, difference call, in publishing. We call it zillionth. <laughs> um, and the idea of adapting the book for younger readers was, I must confess, not my idea. Um, it was the idea of, uh, of, of the publishers of this new edition of the book. And I, I thought it seemed like a really uh, a fun idea. And, um, and, and so we, we embarked on this. Now, I, I, I'm going to say I had a lot of help um, because I would not all on my own have known what to do. Um, it was like, do you want it shorter? Do you want it maybe a little less salty? Um, and, and it's turned out to be both of those things. Um, but there were any number of ways where we worked on uh, making it appropriate and, and one hopes a little bit more sort of in, in inviting and appealing uh, to younger readers, changing some of the uh, cited examples of, of, of books and authors and, and just trying to make it um, friendlier to, to, to a younger class of reader without um, making it condescending or patronizing. Uh, it's still, I mean, it's still me. It's still my voice. It still sounds like me. Um, and I think that I, I kind of um, revel in the idea that I think it's a pretty sophisticated book still. Um, and, and I'm hoping that the, 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 the readers who come to it uh, will find things in it that they, um, uh, that, that they can make good use of. Um, I mean, as was the case with the original version of the book, where I did say, this is, you know, this is not a primer. This is not uh, an exhaustive book about everything you need to know about everything. It is about subjects where I feel like I have something to bring to the table. So I, I, am, I am grateful uh, in advance for all of the work that uh, English teachers and parents have done for the, uh, for the readers of this new edition of the book. 
um, uh, I, I hope, talking them through a lot of the rudiments so that I can come in with some things that I think are helpful to, to people who want to write, to people who, uh, who, who, who enjoy this sort of thing. Well, I also think it's not just for, I mean, I know you say it's adapted for younger readers, but this is like a really good thing, even for adults who just, maybe they don't have your book, maybe they're, your book's in that shelf and they want to have the children look closer because they're like, wait, what about that comma? And do I put the comma before the quotes or after the quotes? And I think my favorite line of your book is in the beginning when you were talking directly to younger readers and being like, I know that you think you know how to write, but just wait for it. You might be talking to people who aren't like the people you know right now. <laughs> like there might be time in your life where you have to apply for a job or do any of these grown up things and language might come in handy. So you yeah. said it in a very funny way. So if that's the saltiness you referred to, um, I liked it. <laughs> and, and, and I just, you know, I, I, I don't know that it is possible to inspire an affection for reading or writing out of thin air. I mean, I think that there's an audience uh, for this book uh, that is uh, that is not simply going to be parents buying copies and sticking it under the noses of their children. Um, but I, I'm hoping that I, I'm hoping that younger people who were as enchanted by the written word as I was, you know, virtually from the dawn of my consciousness, will will find something useful here and and and, and something fun. I mean, I I, I I like to think that the original version of the book is fun. I like to think that this new version of the book is fun. You mentioned in the book the sign that hung over the the bakery store where you got your hollow rolls every week, um, and how terrible the grammar was, and that was your sort of origin story for your career in copy editing. Um, tell me a little bit about that, and also just more about getting started in this world and how you knew you loved language so much. And all right, so so I I, I always say, I say in the book that the story of my mother sending me to this bakery. Um, to, to buy rolls or black and whites or whatever uh, needed to be brought home. I would, so I would bike up to the bakery, but there was this sign in the bakery that said, try our Ruggalock, they're the best in quotation marks. And I remember just sort of staring at it. And, and <laughs> even then I had the notion that to put quotation marks around something indicated a, a, uh, 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 that, that, that what you are saying, uh, lacked a level of earnestness. Um, and and I have I, I like to say that that's my origin story. That's how I that's how I became at the age of you know 10 uh, a copy editor, even if I didn't get around to starting to do that uh, uh, till decades later. But the, the real thing truly, you know, my 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 origin story is, and I remember asking my mother about this while I was working on the on the book, I said, you know, I don't remember you're teaching me how to read. Um, I know that by the time I got to kindergarten, I was already reading, but I, I don't remember you teaching me to read. And she said, I never taught you to read. I read to you. And at a certain point, you started reading. And I, and, and I know, I mean, I, I, I'm not unique in that. I have heard variations on this story from, from a number of people, but I do still think about that sort of magical thing that happens in a brain, uh, you know, uh, associated with, uh, with, with, with language, but not merely, you know, imitating that, you know, we hear when other people are talking, but to suddenly recognize as sound and symbol unite that this stuff on the page has meaning. Um, and and I've always, uh, I've, I've, I've always read incessantly. I was the traditional kid with his nose buried in a book. Um, so yeah, so yeah. And, and as to my getting into this professionally, um, you know, when I, got, when I got out of college, when I graduated uh, from college, I just sort of embarked on this wonderful career of not doing very much at all. Um, and, I, and I liked it. Um, I, I, I liked, <laughs> I liked going to double features. I liked uh, going to the zoo in Chicago. I liked working in restaurants and bars so that I had cash in my pocket. How, so did, your, how, how, did, your, how did your mom feel about that? You know, I think that they were, my parents were sort of indulgent in that regard. I mean, they had never been, 
you know, they had never been the type to say, you must do this. Um, and I was, you know, I, was, I had been pretty self-motivating through 12 years of basic school and the four years of college. And, and maybe after that, I just sort of had enough <laughs> for a while. And, and so I just sort of, uh, you know, wandered, wandered around and amused myself. But at a certain point, you do kind of recognize that you, you need to grow up. Um, and and I, was, I, I was a bit at a loss. I didn't really know what I wanted, uh, what I wanted to do. And I had a, a friend who was a published writer and I said, there has to be something in publishing I can do. And, and, and he introduced me to the person who hired me to do my first proofreading jobs. And from learning how to proofread, which I sort of faked my way into, um, I learned then how to copy edit. And uh, by, by, because when you're proofreading, you're looking at a manuscript on which copy editing has occurred. Um, so I'm seeing this sort of dialogue that's going on between the copy editor and the author. And I found it, I found it very interesting. And, and what I found as I was doing this work, this proofreading work, and, and then after that, the copy editing work was that I had a really good instinct uh, for the work, but based almost not at all on knowledge of it, um, you know, real knowledge of it, terms. I mean, my, 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 uh, English, my education in the English language is, to put it nicely, rudimentary. Um, so I had to learn all this stuff. I had to, I had to learn what a subjunctive was. Uh, I had to learn how semicolons worked. I had to learn all of this. But the funny thing really is that when you're doing the work, when you, when you are copy editing for a while, you learn it all and then you go back to relying on your ear and your eye. Um, it, it's good to know what things are called, but, but ultimately uh, it's a conversation between you and a writer and it's, it's about hearing the words and seeing the words and, and, and getting them to work as effectively as they possibly can. I feel like I learned most of the stuff, not in school, but when I had to study for one of those achievement tests to get into college, you know, and you get those like study guides, I feel like that's when you learn. I feel like sometimes in school, as much as they teach you, and you know, I went to really great schools all the way through, blah, blah, blah. They don't stop and say like, no, 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 you shouldn't say you're anxious for this. You should say you're eager to do that and all these things. And like, for whatever reason, when I learned all that stuff, like when it was all spelled out to me, it's stuck in my head more than anything. Like forget all the other subjects and everything. Um, but those are the things. So now ever like my husband's like, oh, uh, you know, I was really anxious to do this. I was like, no, no, like you were eager. eager to do it. And it like bothers me so much. So you have your whole chapter on like pet peeves. And I'm like, yes, these <laughs> bother me so much for no good reason. <laughs> um, but I don't know, I don't know why. I mean, there is grammar obviously taught in school but I just feel like they, maybe they just miss a little bit of this stuff. I, you know, I mean, there's, there, well, there's, there's so much, I mean, it's, it's been a while since I was in school. Uh, <laughs> but there's, 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 there's so much going on. There's, there's so much to teach. There's so much to learn. There's so much to absorb. There's only so much time. Yes. Very um, true. And, and I, yes, of course, I remember being taught the difference between, you know, a subject and a predicate, the difference between an adjective and an adverb. Um, and, and basically from my teachers who were my favorite teachers, uh, you know, in elementary school, in high school, and in college, the ones that I appreciated most were simply the ones who helped me love to read, who were able to convey the excitement and the joy of what you can learn in reading. And, and, and not only learn, I, don't, I, I mean, Reading is not just for learning. Reading is for art. Reading is for the love of it. Reading is for the pleasure uh, of it. But, um, you know, I mean, unless, unless you're a pro, uh, you know, unless you're doing this for a living, you do get to retain for your entire life, I hope, the pleasure of simply reading a book for the pleasure of simply reading a book. So do you still enjoy the pleasure of simply reading books despite all the books that you work on? Um, you know, I, I do. 
I, I do. And I have always been happy when the work day is over because I'm, I'm still working for, uh, for Random House and, and I have time to read things that are entirely divorced uh, from my job. I, I have certainly found um, in the last year since the, since the descent on us of the, uh, of the plague that uh, I, I, I know I am not unique in this. My attention span is a little diminished. <laughs> Yep. Sometimes uh, I I watch a lot of I watch a lot of movies on TV now, um, but I I do still read. Uh, but I find myself rereading things. Mm. Uh, it's it's uh, there's a great pleasure. There's always been a great pleasure for me in returning to books that I I love. But but sometimes that's really all I've got the strength for. Right now. Not a big rereader. I reread a book I loved like in my 20s recently. Um, it was called Drinking a Love Story by Caroline Knapp. And I, sure. just, and I was like, did you read that? Anyway, I loved it. I loved it when it came out. I was like, oh my gosh, I love this one. And then when she passed away, I was like so sad. Like it, it was like a friend had passed away. Anyway, then I was like, well, I haven't read this in two decades. I wonder why I loved it so much. And then I went back and read it. And of course you have like a new set of life experiences that you bring to it, right? So you interpret it in a whole new way. And I was like, well, I don't know, it's just different. You just relate to things completely differently, but maybe that's the magic in rereading. I don't know. You know, it, I mean, it can be if it's a thing that you like to do. I mean, and I've always been like a crazy rereader. Hmm. Um, I, I just like to go back to books that I, I love and just go through them all again. Um, one of the things that's interesting now, and one of the things that sort of plays into my love of rereading is that I'm at, now at work on my next book, oh. uh, which is to be called, unless anybody changes their mind, which is to be called Dreyer's Fiction. Ooh. And, and in it, I am simply taking passages from works of fiction that I deeply love and trying to explain from a copy editorial point of view, um, why they work. Huh. And how they work, and um, and I th and I hope that people will enjoy it just for the sake of seeing things kind of broken down into their parts. But also, my intention is to uh, is, is 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 to it's like what can this teach you as a writer if you mm -hmm. happen to be a writer? What can we learn from? And and so it's going to be a lot of books that I love. So what can we learn from Shirley Jackson? Like you know, one of my, my favorite writers. You know, what can we learn from The Haunting of Hill House? What can we learn from Marilyn Robinson's housekeeping? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I seem, uh, I was gonna say, from Edith Wharton's The House of Mirth. I seem to like books that have houses in them. <laughs> um, but so I'm, I'm, now I'm going through my whole library wow. and going back to these books and rereading them and, and finding things in them that I hadn't necessarily noticed before. That's really interesting. And I'm having a very, I'm ha so far I'm having a very good time. So. Oh, I can't wait to read that. That's so cool. I yeah. mean, you, you touch on some of the things in this book of like what makes a good description and how to, you know, introduce people in fiction a little more, but to go into past passages. I mean, essentially copy editing, it's almost like you're the makeup artist of the talented celebrity, right? Like they, they are, they have talent already, but they're going to look so much better once you've had a chance. That's great. That's that's great. I love that because you know that is that is how I that is how I think of it. It, it. It's like my my job, as I like to say, is to is to help an author make their book into the best possible version of itself. Right. That it can be, and and it's about polishing and refining and maybe just sort of switching things around a little bit and and just. You know, I mean, uh, once a once a manuscript's gone going into copy editing, I mean, the writer has presumably spent a very long time with it. And as I certainly learned when I was in the ed editing process of my book, at a certain point, your eyes just roll back into your head at the very sight of your own words. <laughs> you know, it's like, I just can't see this anymore. I need somebody who's not me mm -hmm. to look at it and tell me where it's not working you know, where it can be better. And, and uh, you know, what I learned as a, as a copy editor, uh, you know, learning that my job is to, is to assist writers with, with respect and, 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 and with a sense of, I, I don't know, I don't like the word humility, but, but, but a sense of, I'm here to help you. Mm -hmm. um, that, uh, 
the, 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 you, you, you know, no copy editor can make a bad book into a good book. Uh, but you can always take a good book and make it a little better and you can make a great book. Well, it's great already, but let's see what happens when we just sort of tighten the screws a little bit. Yes, I love that. Well, maybe I'll send you a little makeup kit so you can remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, in your in the beginning of this book, when you talk about the wand intensifiers and throat clears and like all the words you should try not to use like really and actually on stuff. Um, I'm going to take this challenge because I like to write for fun myself. So I am going to try for like the next two weeks to not use any of these words. And that is a big challenge <laughs> because I feel like I use them a lot, especially just and of course and whatever. Anyway, so I'm taking your challenge to heart. I'm going to, I'm going to try it. People, you know, I mean, and the thing is, it's like, there's a reason why I put that at the very beginning of the book. Um, because people seem to find it highly amusing. Um, but also it's just, it's, it's just, it's so, 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 it's so simple. Um, it, it's, 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 here are some words and here are some words that don't accomplish much. And let's see if we can do without them. Uh, you know, the thing that I always, as I always do say is, A, I'm not telling you how to talk, because uh, if you tried to regulate your own speech and stopped every time you were about to utter the word very or rather or actually, you would just stop talking and that's not a good thing. Um, but even when you're writing, I mean, you can write those words down, but if you're actually writing something with the intention of letting somebody else see it, when you go back through it the second time is when you can is when you can prune, is when you can cut things out that aren't helping you uh, at, at all. Uh, I, I think one thing that's very important for anybody uh, who's who's writing is that if you if you turn on the editorial switch too soon, if you turn on the editorial switch, when you are in the act of composing, you will paralyze yourself. Um, and that's, that's not good. Um, so do what you're doing. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't write thoughtlessly. I don't go into a trance and three hours later, there's 2000 words and I'm like, oh, where did those come from? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I write consciously and I, I do, tweak a little bit while I'm composing, but you just have to sort of let yourself write. You can always fix it later. I think you're so right. I think people just get caught up in, is this sentence right? Can I make this sentence better? And then they don't go to the next sentence. And next thing you know, yeah. five, five years go by and you know. Nothing's have, happened. Nothing, they're like, why can't I write a book? But you're absolutely yeah. right. The wrong switches got turned on. Yes. Maybe I mean, you're more like a mechanic. I don't know. Now I'm like, <laughs> I, I always, I think of it as, uh, you know, as being a cobbler, you know? Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's a craft. Yes. It's a piano tuner, right? A piano tuner. Yes. Yeah. And we'll just keep going with these. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you've already given so much good advice. Do you have any parting advice for everybody um, who's listening? Maybe something that they didn't know or something. I, I'm just going to say that, um, that I think that one of the best things that anybody who is writing can do when they are trying to figure out what's working and what's not working is read your writing aloud. Um, you'll hear what's wrong. Um, and, and I also think that there is always, the, that there is much to be learned for, for writers. There's, there's two things you can do uh, as, a, as a budding or even not so budding writer, if you really want to, 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 to break things down and learn things. A, read somebody else's work aloud, you know, your own work, somebody else's work. But an experiment that I, I tried once and I learned so much from it is take something you really love lay the book in front of you, open up a word file and type it all out, like a short story or, or a chapter. The art, the, excuse me, the art, the act of recreating somebody else's writing with your own hands, with your own fingers, you'll be amazed at how much you can learn. Um, hmm. and, uh, and, and I think it's a, I think it's a great way to, to meet somebody else's writing and to, to, 
help you figure out what the what the magic might be. Benjamin Dreyer recommends plagiarism. More in yeah. eleven. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's an excellent tip. I have not heard that before. And that seems like a really fun thing to do. I mean, why not? That's really interesting. Yeah. Very cool. Um, well, thank you so much. There's so much I didn't get a chance to ask you, but um, it was lovely to meet you. And thank you, um, thank you again for uh, all your tips and for putting a lot of debates to bed by having the actual answers out there in a book, particularly one I can share with other people in my family. <laughs> so thanks. Great. <laughs> All right. Well, have a have a great weekend. You too. Thanks for spending time with me. I'll see you. You too. Okay. Bye. Bye.